All right, let's get started. So uh, welcome to the next plenary talk. My name is Thomas Hillen from University of Alberta. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce my good friend and colleague, Fritjof Lutscher, who wins uh, this year's Kames Research Prize. So uh, Fritjof and I, we actually shared an office when I was a postdoc and he was a PhD student in Tübingen under the uh, leadership of Karl Hadler. Then we, we had a time where we had the same office. Really nice. So uh, Fritjof, uh, after his PhD in 2000, he came to uh, University of Alberta in Edmonton to work with Mark Lewis as a postdoc. And then uh, since 2005, he is a faculty member at University of Ottawa, where he started on a tenure track uh, uh, stream and then got through all the ranks, assistant, associate, full professor. And uh, he has had tremendous impact in the modeling of population biology and uh, ecology. He's well known for his modeling on river ecosystems, for example. And uh, just recently he published a book on integral difference equations. And that's the first book on integral difference equations in, uh, in mathematical biology. And I'm sure it is kind of a, a, a base uh, for, for many people or for much uh, research to come in the future. Okay. So uh, Kames is honored to award the uh, 2022 research award to Future of Luchar in recognition of his outstanding contributions to mathematical ecology, his accomplishment uh, work and, and his innovative and interdisciplinary approach to research will continue to influence the research in mathematical ecology and applied mathematics for many years to come. Please, Richard. Thank you very much, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you for your kind words. Um, thanks to Kames for the prize, for inviting me here. And thank you all for being here. It's a great honor and a great pleasure to be here. And I do want to talk about biological invasions. But whenever we talk about biological invasions, there's an elephant in the room. And that elephant is humans. <laughs> because we humans are actually the biggest biological invaders. Wherever we show up, we destroy not only ecosystems, but also cultures. And that's true. Uh -huh. If I could advance, that would be good. There. That's true both in the Ottawa area where I live and work, and it's true in the Kelowna area where we're having this meeting that's so wonderfully organized by Rebecca and her team. And so I re pay respect to the First Nations who are the traditional guardians of this land. And I acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory which remains unceded. And I acknowledge their knowledge keepers and their leaders past, present, and future. On a much more personal level, I want to say thanks to three individuals who are very, very important in my life. The first is my father, without whom I just would not be, period. Second, as Tom has already mentioned, is my doctoral supervisor, Kapi Hadler, without whom I would not be in math biology. And the third is my postdoctoral advisor, Mark Lewis, without whom I would not be in Canada and probably wouldn't be standing here in front of you. Mark continues to be a wonderful friend and mentor. It was also Mark Lewis who about 20 years ago introduced me to this groundbreaking paper and in that paper, I found a challenge that I could not resolve until 10 years later. And when I did, it was the start of this whole research area that I want to tell you about today. And I want to tell you about the journey that I've had and the lessons that I've learned from that. So what was the challenge? What's the challenge in that paper? And that challenge is kind of put together in this graph here. So this graph shows 
the rate at which a population expands in a heterogeneous landscape as a function of the rate at which individuals move in some parts of this landscape. And the part that I tripped over when I saw this figure was the fact that this curve here goes up and then comes down, which means as individuals go faster, the overall population spread slows down and eventually stops. Why? So I want to take you on this journey, which will take us first very briefly through a bit of the background of modeling invasions in homogeneous landscapes and then random walks in heterogeneous landscapes. And because the word heterogeneous is so long, I call it patchy. And that can help us solve this challenge. And then I want to take you through three applications that I have worked on with many students and collaborators since. So the history of biological invasions modeling starts with another groundbreaking paper. I picked the one by Skellum 1951, where he measured the area that has been invaded by muskrats in Europe starting in the 1900s. And he plotted the square root of the area as a function of time, and he found this beautiful straight line, which seems to indicate that there is a constant speed at which the population spreads in any direction. There's a lot of interesting mathematics in that paper too, many different models, many different suggestions. One of them, the simplest one in today's language reads a little bit like what I have on the blue part of the slide, where I have individuals on a, simply on a line doing a random walk and they can either move to the left or the right, they do so with equal probability, or they can just stay put. And when you go from that description to the so-called parabolic limit, which means you make the time steps in which individuals move shorter, and you make the jump length at which they jump shorter in a certain predefined way, then you get to the diffusion equation. So now you are from the individual level to the population level. And then of course, muskrats don't just move around, they also reproduce, some of them die. So you add a reaction term, the net birth minus death rate. And then you have this reaction diffusion equation here together, the, the really simplest linear case. Then you can from that derive a speed, which I will call the spreading speed. And for those of you who know what I'm talking about, I, I am fully aware that there are subtle differences between many different speeds that try to describe the same thing. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to just say spreading speed, which will be the same as traveling wave speeds and, and other things. So Scallum could build his work on the work by Fisher KPP in the 30s. And all of this has led to a lot of mathematics work, um, starting with Aronson and Weinberger and then going on in fact, many people in this room have worked on this and know much more about this than I do. But all of that assumes a homogeneous landscape. The probability P of moving left and right doesn't depend on space. Reality looks different. Reality landscapes look more like this. And here is another um, good example of us elephants. And so if we want to model something like this, then maybe we need to have different landscapes than just homogeneous landscapes. So if we have, let's say, a forest here, we can write down a random walk within a forest and can get a diffusion equation, a diffusion coefficient from there. And then we have an open field and we can write a different uh, random walk there and we have a different diffusion coefficient. And in fact, there is a, it's a recent review paper that has, I believe, 79 different species. And for the vast majority of them, the D and the D are not the same. And for the vast majority of them, individuals move a lot faster when they are in landscapes that they find unfavorable, where they don't find good food, where they don't find good shelter. And they move a lot slower 
in a region where they do find food and shelter and all these things. And it makes immediate sense because who wants to be stuck in a place where they don't like it, right? And then there are these additional locations where individuals can decide, am I going into the forest or am I going into the open meadows? And there is ample evidence that on average, well, that typically this probability is not a half. So individuals do bias their walks usually in a direction where they want to be. And so the plot down here shows for one particular species of butterfly, the probability of entering a habitat is negative related, negatively related to the rate at which they move in this habitat. And since we've just learned that individuals move less in habitats that they like, this means that they go more into habitats that they like. And so now we have a combination that makes sense to us. We go to where we want to be, for example, in Kelowna, and then we stay here. We move very little except for between here and the buffet, maybe. <laughs> so how do we put all of this in a mathematical model now? This was pioneered in a paper by Ovaskainen and Cornell in the Journal of Applied Probability. And then um, Gabriel Maciel, a bright, wonderful student from Brazil came to visit my lab and took this up and took it another step further. And so what we did is we wrote down basically the picture, we translated the picture I just showed you into a random walk over here to which we applied the parabolic limit to get a diffusion equation in blue and the same in green on the other side. And then we just needed to deal with the red interface in the middle. If you take the very same parabolic limit and are careful in what you do, you can derive a condition that the flux at this interface point has to be continuous. That doesn't mean anything else, but individuals who leave one patch have to appear in the other. They can't just die, they can't just reappear. Uh, we have to have conservation of mass. The thing that's not so easy to guess is the last equation on the slide here, which says that the densities at this interface typically don't match. They're not continuous, they're typically off. And they're off by two factors. One of them is if there's a preference. So if the alpha is not equal to a half, then the densities typically don't match. But they're also off depending on the ratio of the diffusion coefficients. And so this line here is actually the only line by which our model differs from that by Shigesada et al, which is what I showed you at the beginning. So then the question was, could this one little change actually make a difference in the outcome of the figure that I showed you in the beginning? And the answer is it can, otherwise I wouldn't be here, obviously. So here's the setup that Shigesada used and that we used as well. We have this infinite, line of habitat patches and they're periodically ordered and they alternate between good habitat which biologists would call a source and bad habitat or unfavorable habitat which a biologist would call a sink where the population growth is negative where deaths are stronger than, than births um, and then between any two of them we have these interface conditions that i showed you on the other slide and so here is the picture that I showed you earlier without really explaining all the details. So now I can tell you that the D1, the movement rate on the X axis is the diffusion in these unfavorable patches. And, and on the Y axis is the overall population spread rate. And this is precisely the pattern that you've seen before. So if you increase diffusion in sink patches, then your population can eventually stop if these sink patches are long enough. So the numbers here are the length of these sink patches periodically. Whereas with our different matching conditions here, we see the pattern that we would more expect, namely the faster individuals move through a sink patch, the faster the overall population progresses. In fact, if populations, sorry, if individuals don't move fast enough through a sink patch, then the overall population just stops. So this counterintuitive behavior that Shigesada found, but didn't actually really discuss in their paper, goes away. 
Not only that, we can also explain it with our little formula down here, because if you look at what happens if you make D1 large, and at the same time, try to have continuity, so have this condition here, then you'd have to have the alpha go to one. Right? And that means that individuals tend to not cross from one into another patch because alpha is the probability of staying in a good patch. Right? So if that goes to one, that means the individuals just don't go beyond the patch where they are. And obviously then the population can't spread. So that was nice. But of course, when you have a new set of equations, in this case, reaction diffusion equations that are coupled through interface conditions, you have a whole bunch of mathematical analysis to do to know that you're actually on safe ground with, with what you're doing. And um, there's one recent paper that is probably the most comprehensive of those, where um, we said we have either finite or an infinite number of patches stuck together. On each of them, we have such a reaction diffusion equation. And then at these matching conditions, sorry, at the interfaces, we have these matching conditions. And then we can prove the well-postness of the system. So existence and uniqueness of solutions, continuous dependence on initial conditions. And we do this by applying um, semi-group theory. And then under additional conditions on the reaction terms, we can get global existence. We can get the existence of a positive steady state. And once we have that, we can use existing theory to prove the existence of a spreading speed. Or in this case, because we have heterogeneity, right, it would be um, periodic traveling wave, not a simple traveling wave that we're looking at. But overall, we can still so show something like an existence of an asymptotic speed. And most importantly for what's to come here is we can show that again under certain conditions on the Fs that the speed is linearly determined, which means essentially we have a simple formula like the C star that Skellum got on the very first slide. Right? It's not quite as simple, but it is a formula that one can evaluate rather than having to run simulations to test how fast your population is moving. So that means some biology and some mathematics, but it turns out we can also put some physics into the match and understand this from a slightly different perspective. So Fourier said that heat flows down gradients of temperature. And Skellum said that populations flow down gradients of something, and at something he called dynamic level. Rather than gradients of populations, gradients of, popul of dynamic level. And that has implications for the steady state, right? At a steady state, temperature is constant. Heat doesn't have to be. If I put my hand here for long enough, eventually my hand and the desk here will have the same temperature. But the heat depends on the specific coefficients and all of these things. And something similar is true for the populations. At steady state, the dynamic level has to be constant, but the population density does not have to be, which is what we just saw in the model, right? We have these discontinuities because in some sense, the capacity of the landscape differs between the two patches. It was then Turchin who said or proved that the steady state density should be proportional to the dynamic level, whatever that is, times a residence index, now this is something that Turchin introduced, and he said the residence index is something that's proportional to the time spent at a location. And so if we divide the steady state density by the residence index, we get the dynamic level, we know what that should be. Now for our model, we can explicitly calculate the residence index. So a residence index time at an individual spends at a location is high when the diffusion rate is low. That makes sense because diffusion means how much these individuals move. But it also depends on the alpha, right? If individuals tend to stay into good patches, then the residence index in the good patches goes up. So that's why we also see the alpha show up here in these denominators. And with that setting, the dynamic level 
so defined, it's actually continuous in our model. And that has this really nice, opens up this really nice route of analyzing the equations, which now have a continuous quantity rather than these discontinuities. And so, for example, this allowed us to um, develop a homogenization theory for these patchy landscapes so that we could calculate things like spread rates from a much simpler homogeneous model, basically back to Skellum's simple formula, two times square root dr, except for the r and the d now were complicated expressions of our model parameters. But the formula was simple in the end. And this picture down here from a paper by Brian, Cobble, Brian York and, and Christina Cobble just shows you how good the homogenization approach is. One of them is the um, exact equation, sorry, the exact solution, and the other is the approximate solution that comes from the homogenization. homogenization. So once you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so this idea has taken off. Not all of these papers have me involved in them, but all of these have somehow these different interface conditions and patchy landscapes in them. And they range from very mathematical existence proofs to very ecological applications. And I wanna take you through three of these applications. I wanna start with the pink ones about invasive forest insects and conservation implications. Then I want to move to the orange ones, moving habitat models, and I want to end off with the green ones about ecosystem engineers. And I, I just couldn't resist and put another elephant in here. But I don't want to talk about fish here. I want to talk about forest insects. So up here is the emerald ash borer. And just below, we have one of its larvae. So it puts its larvae into it bores in, hence the name, into ash trees, puts its larvae in there. The larvae start consuming the phloem, which is the part of the tree under the bark and between the core wood where the tree pushes all the nutrients up and down. And so they destroy the tree's pumping infrastructure, so to speak. And after a couple of years of infestation, they kill the tree. So these, um, Ash borers were detected around Detroit in the early 2000s. And then as you can see from this map, they spread pretty quickly. Uh, in 2004 here, this article estimated that already 7 million trees had been killed by this beetle. So in only two or three years. Now at the beginning, there was this hope in Canada that they could stop the spread of emerald ash borer into Canada because there's after all only this fairly narrow bridge by which it could come into Canada. Um, and so what they did is they cleared a large area of 10 by 30 kilometers of all ash trees because the emerald ash borer only reproduces on ash trees. So no ash trees, no baby ash borers. That sounded pretty easy. And 10 by 30 kilometers required removing 80,000 ash trees. Was, there was a lot of resistance, of course, but they tried anyway, uh, unfortunately with no, not much success. And by 2008, we already had the beetle in Ottawa because it did not just fly, it also hitchhiked on trucks and all kinds of other things. But it does ask the interesting questions. Can we manage an ecosystem, in this case a forest, can we manage the resources of insect pests that we don't like? in such a way as to slow them down or maybe prevent them from coming at all. And so what we did is we wrote down a very simple model where we said, we can either have a homogeneous forest or we can have a forest with gaps. We know we use gaps for fire breaks, so maybe they also work for beetles. And we have an equation for the insect, how it works, how it, how it moves, how it reproduces. And in this case, we also have an equation for the trees, how they die, but we did not put reproduction of the trees in there because that happens on a very different time scale. So we ran two simulations for starters, one with a constant tree level to begin with and all the insects at zero. And after I think 20 or so um, generations, we had the insects sitting here in this nice pulse and the trees be behind the pulse are all dead. 
and in front of the poles, there are still trees to go to. And then we took half of all the trees up. So it's a bit difficult to see, but this is literally a patch with trees and a patch without and a patch with trees and a patch without. And we ran the same initial condition, half the amount of resources, same number of generations, and our insect got considerably further and arguably to a higher density. And so that sounded a little bit weird, but it's actually true. That's what comes out of the model. And it comes out of the model because of what I said earlier that the insects tend to move faster in areas where they don't find good resources. So if they moved without any adaptation, then indeed, if you increase the fraction of gaps, you would decrease the spread of the population, yes. But if you increase the fraction of gaps and the beetles adapt to that, for example, for the thick blue line here, they move twice as fast in the gaps as they move in the trees, then they can easily move faster on less resources. And that should give us all something to think about when we try to manage ecosystems for something that we'd like to have or like to avoid. Now, the flip side of invasion is conservation, because there are other species that we'd like them to increase their territory. Right? In this case, the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, which is endangered. And we love it so much because it looks so beautiful. So we'd like it to spread into regions where it can actually do well. So we have these habitat um, patches where they have lots of their host plants. Again, that's where they lay their eggs, that's where they feed. And this is interspersed with what ecologists call matrix habitat, it has nothing to do with areas of numbers. And it can be of different type and a beautiful aspect of this project is that we have three different matrix types. So we have sink quality, sink habitat, that means there's still some host plants, but not great. Then we have open habitat, there are no host plants whatsoever, there's no reproduction. And then we have forest, again, no host plants, no reproduction. And we have data on how they move in each of these different types. And we have data on their preference, so the alpha going into that habitat or not. And so we could put together the good habitat with three different matrix habitats and see what happens. And so it turns out that if we put them together with the open habitat, this dash dot line, where even though there's no population growth, but the movement in this habitat is just so fast, then with somewhere between 10 and 20% of high quality habitat, we could get really, really fast range expansion of the species. So that means we can use this to our advantage and say, look, we don't have to plant high quality habitat everywhere. We can intersperse high quality habitat with this open habitat that really pushes the insects to move further, pushes the butterfly, butterflies to, to really advance and therefore get them, for example, to places where they wanna be and where they can be and where they have lots of host plants. So careful management and kind of using the natural response of those species could help us in conservation. And one of the reasons why we want them to move is because climate change will have to move them anyway. And so that's my next topic. No, this way. So climate change moves habitats around. This is just the next province over. And you see projected mean annual temperature up to the year 2000 and up to the year 2050. You see things like this orange band here, down here in Southern Alberta and will, or is expected to move all the way to Central Alberta here, is being replaced by even warmer temperatures. And so one way to think about this and to model this is we pick the climate zone that's best for that species and that's going to be our source patch. And to the north of that, we have a sink patch because it's too cold. And to the south of that, we have a sink patch because it's too warm. Right? And then we see what happens if this source patch moves over time. So the first 
two papers on that topic are by uh, Alex Potapoff and Mark Lewis in 2004, and then by Barry Sticky and, and co-workers in 2009, they did exactly that. We have a constant rate at which the habitat moves, so it means it stays a constant width. And we have very simple, the front is the same as the back, has a simple um, decay term here, mortality, whereas in the middle we have basically Fisher's equation. And so if this middle area was just everything, this population would spread with, again, the C star that we saw on the Skellum slide, which is two in the scaling, it's intrinsic speed. But if we cut these off, then the theorem that comes out of both of these papers says the population cannot persist if the habitat moves faster than the species would be able to spread by itself. If the habitat moves slower than that, then the species can persist provided the habitat is long enough. And there's a really nice geometric way of looking at this because you can transform these three equations basically into phase plane analysis. And so the part that's behind the good patch corresponds to that one blue line. And the part that's in front corresponds to the other blue line. And the part in the middle generates a phase plane. And the goal for us is now to find a trajectory that starts on one of these lines and ends on the other. And if C is less than C star, then the zero point is a spiral. And so everything that goes through one of the two lines will have to go through the other as well. And it's just a matter of finding the right L. But if C is bigger than C star, then the point at zero becomes an unstable node and you get two unstable manifolds that shoot out between these blue lines that you can't get from one to the other anymore. Except for a student came to me and said, I wanna work with you and I think we can do something different here because ahead of the front, it's colder and behind the front, it's warmer. So there should be two different behaviors there, potentially different movement rates, whatnot. And then these species should be able to detect when it gets too hot and too cold. And so we should put the same boundary, the, sorry, the same interface conditions on here as I have talked to you about earlier. And so if you do that, then the theorem looks different. It says no matter how, how fast your habitat moves, the population can always persist, provided that they're good enough at detecting where the end comes to scoop them up. So provided the alpha is large enough and they can actually turn back into the good habitat or they move fast enough once they get outside. And what happens geometrically is here you have the back end, the light blue line is the front end. And as I said, there are these two unstable manifolds that prevent you from crossing from here into here. But if you can play with alpha and D1, you can turn this back end all the way down to here. And then you can show that you can actually find trajectories that start here and end there. I was really lucky because the student stayed for me for longer and she started to do numerics on this because it's actually quite tricky. Um, one of the things that we found in a typical profile is not only do you have to deal with these discontinuities, you also have to deal with pretty steep gradients at times and you have an habitat that moves. So where do you start and end your numerical domain, right? It's, it's not so easy. And then you have what people call this zombie population. Sounds really good. And so we teamed up with a colleague of mine, uh, Yves Bourgo, and, and um, the student, Jane McDonald, who is here in the audience, wrote um, code, efficient and fast code to simulate this. And one of the things she found that was that some kind of an intermediate speed of your climate change would actually lead to higher population density than no climate change at all. That was kind of a funny, funny thing. And of course, to a large extent, that's due to that zombie population that trails your good habitat. Now, once we had code, we could do all kinds of things that you can't do with the analysis. For example, we could do what happens if the front end moves faster than the back end. 
And if your habitat gets larger, that's the case down here. That's the back end, that's the front end, the habitat gets larger. And we see that in the middle, the population starts to spread just like a traveling wave and doesn't even notice the two endpoints. Here we have the back end move exactly at the same speed as the fisher speed. So that's, that's the fastest the population can do. And you see how this zombie population is pretty big here. And here we have a case where climate change accelerates. And of course, at some point, the population just dies out. And Jane has since gone on to do much more interesting things. She has done climate change varying over time, and she has done two-dimensional stuff. And she will talk about that today, this afternoon, in Mini Symposium 31. So if you want to hear more of that, go and see her. And that brings me to the last bit, the final application that I want to talk to you about. And that's the case when individuals can push the boundaries of their habitats. These individuals or these species are called ecosystem engineers and they are able to alter their abiotic habitat. And so we all know beavers and when beavers show up there, they change the entire landscape. They put lakes in so they can have safe uh, places to, to burrow, sorry, not to burrow, to have their beaver lodges. Um, and it all changes, but it doesn't have to be mammals. It can be plants as well. So this is a cord grass, um, Spartina. And what it does, it, when it manages to get in here where the, the sea comes in and floods every now and then, when it can get a hold, it will increase sedimentation. And that means it will decrease the flooding that happens regularly by the tides, so on. And then there will be more Spartina. And then it will be more sedimentation. And eventually it'll create a little ledge there and it'll be protected from the tides coming in and washing it out. At the same time, these other plants here that kind of needed this regular water coming in, they're drying up. They don't have these resources anymore. So Spartina can spread in both directions by engineering its habitat, by really changing the quality of the habitat. So plants can do that too. So envi we envision to model this by saying, okay, on the one hand, we have this engineered habitat where the population can grow. And the, on the other hand, we have the non-engineered habitat where the population cannot grow. And in the middle, we have this interface that is now pushed by the individuals that live there. Question, how? Well, we just went back to the original approach when we model how an individual moves, like left and right or staying put. And so we did the same thing for this boundary point and said this boundary point can be moved with a probability mu or can stay put with a probability one minus mu. And we think it should be moved with a probability that's a proportional to how many individuals are actually at the boundary. Right? Because those are the ones the front runners who help the sedimentation or who built the, the dams to set up the lakes. So this should be proportional to alpha u and alpha is simply everybody who stays, who doesn't go this way or that way. When we do this, we come up with a hyperbolic equation, not a parabolic one. So this equation has characteristics. And if we know that at the beginning, the boundary is located at one point, then the boundary will just travel along these characteristics. So we can take the characteristics and use that, use those as the rule for how the boundary moves. So we have again, our two reaction diffusion equations. We have the same matching conditions, at least in the same spirit. And now we have this additional condition for how the boundary moves. That gives us a two-sided free boundary problem. Now free boundary problems, have been used in biology before, um, more recently actually in, in terms of spreading models, but they're different. They're typically using a Stefan condition for how the boundary moves, which means the speed depends on the derivative of the density, whereas here it depends on the density. Now it turns out that proving the existence of solutions to that problem was a lot harder than any of us would have expected. And I don't wanna talk about it here, but it, there, it is in this paper. 
what's much easier to do is to look directly at traveling wave solutions. So that's the last bit I want to talk about, these traveling wave solutions, which are constant speed, constant profile. So the constant speed simply turns into this equation for the L prime. And putting a traveling wave in here gives us, again, a phase plane to study. And it, the, the goal in the phase plane is slightly different now, but not too different, because we have a saddle point here, and we want to connect the unstable manifold from the saddle point to this line here, which corresponds to the boundary condition. If we can do that, then we have a traveling wave. And the answer is, as long as we look at C, the speed, as a parameter, we can do that for any speed between zero and the, the critical C star speed. And then by using some kind of a uh, convergence argument, we can say that there is a unique traveling wave for exactly one speed in that range. And so as a function of the probability to leave, that speed decreases. The more individuals leave, the fewer can push the boundary forward, so the slower the population spreads overall. But in terms of probability of staying, this is this hump shape relationship. So if, if no individuals stay, then obviously no can push the boundaries. If everybody stays, then again, nobody pushes the boundary forward. But somewhere in the middle is the sweet spot where the population can move the fastest. Now, all of this that I'm presenting you is um, with a logistic growth term. But if we put an Ali growth term on there, then things become a lot more interesting. And you can hear about that in a talk tomorrow by another student, uh, Mariam Baziri. And she will be speaking in Mini Symposium 7, part two. So where's all of this going? I think the next step to do is two dimensions. In the original paper in Overskainen and Cornell, they suggested that we can do the same thing as in one dimension, just perpendicular to the boundary, just in the normal direction. And I think we can do this, but it's a lot harder to analyze than the one dimensional case. So Cronin et al. decided to use kind of a simplification and they got really good approximations to the full model in a whole bunch of papers. There's an older paper by Lindsay and Ward that looked at several such blobs of good habitat and persistence conditions, but they didn't include any alphas. So that would be something to, to extend. There's more recent theory by Berestiki et al who looked at spread in two different kinds of media. In this case, it was a large field and maybe a road where, where insects would catch a ride along, along traffic or so. I have not seen a derivation of these equations from a random walk model. That would be another challenge that I would say we should take up. And then there is a whole bunch of other behavior that could happen, not just perpendicular to the boundary, but individuals could choose to control boundaries, patrol boundaries, do other things. So I think there's still a lot that we can do. A couple of the lessons that I've learned here, everything has to fit together. It was in some sense, this picture that got me going on all of this is something just didn't feel right. I couldn't quite grasp it, but something didn't feel right when I first saw that. And um, I think we all need to listen to our intuition when we look at these systems and try to show something, prove something about them. But that means to develop intuition, we have to sometimes dig very deep into the discipline to which we want to apply our math. And we have to become almost specialists on that as well. So to be able to have and develop an intuition and to do work that is actually relevant to those other disciplines. Another thing that I've learned is details really matter. This is just one point. It's a set of measures zero, but the conditions that I put on there measure for a huge amount of uh, control, a huge amount of things. So I think we should always be able to justify the models that we use one level below which we're actually using them. From a population density, we should be able to have the individual level and model there. And finally, less can be more, as we see in these, in these insects here. I mean, as I said, it took about 10 years from first coming up with something is not quite right here to now I can understand why. 
I don't think that those 10 years were a total sink, but it sometimes happens that there is half a year or a year when nothing seems to progress. Now, if I just do the same thing that I usually do, then I really get stuck there. But if I manage to adapt, then I can actually get out of that stronger. And with that, I want to acknowledge all the wonderful people who have worked with me on this over many years, um, both in my lab as also around the world, new collaborations that have shown up um, from this. Um, and I couldn't have done any of that without them. Thank you all for listening. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Fritja. The questions and comments, let's talk. One and two. So with the act for our model, um, you said that uh, gap might potentially speed things up. Is there a size of gap where it's actually controllable? Like if you make a large enough gap of three, you'll be able to pull a gap? It's an interesting question. Uh, yes, it can. And it depends on to a large extent on whether there's an Lie effect or not. I haven't talked about a Lie effect. So a Lie effect means at low densities, the insect is not doing as well as at somewhat higher intermediate densities. If that's the case, then um, we can come up with estimates for gap size that it will not be able to cross. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. And, and, and your whole theory is based on the um, Yes. And you probably you know that in the last 15 years or so, there's a very large body of research showing that the movement from big animals to humans to tiny species, the movement means that are no local because the distribution is a levy flat instead of normal distribution. Like even your example, like the EAD, the distribution is better. Why it made into it? Because there's no local distribution. Right. So I'm wondering, have you thought about how the non-local distribution affect the territory, the habitat, or the invasion? I haven't thought much about non-local dispersal because I think, yeah, one one would have to somehow in, introduce. Uh, behavior at these interfaces, even for these non-local things. And it, it, it becomes, I got kind of a knot in my brain, but something that can sometimes work is instead of saying uh, just non-local dispersal, we say, for example, for the ash borer, we have two modes of dispersal, right? So we have a local dispersal and then we have jumping onto a, a truck and going with that truck. And then we can do something with that. Yeah. Well, there are so many more questions that we have uh, lunch coming up. So, uh, so, so maybe I delay the questions into the break. Is here. And we haven't even asked if anybody online has questions. Oh, yeah, but right. I'm yeah, I'm here until Wednesday night, and more than happy to talk to people um, if they want to come to me. Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. So, lunch is in the administration building, which is the front